All right, a reminder, there will not be class next Monday. So, um, well, let me rephrase that. You guys can come and have class. I just won't be here. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, right, right. Uh, that's true. You can watch reruns. Yeah, there you go. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm going to be in an unskypable location at that time. <laughs> I would think it would be. That sounds like your fault now. Well, yeah, it probably is. Um, at any rate, um, our, our mission for the last couple weeks of class is to wrap up your project. So I want to make sure you have plenty of time to do that. Um, and to discuss JavaScript. JavaScript kind of completes a picture of the three tools, one second, uh, three tools that we have um, relating to client side stuff. We have HTML for the content of a web page. We have CSS for the appearance of a web page. And then we have uh, JavaScript for the behavior or the interactivity of the web page. Did you have a question? Uh, yeah. uh, whatever it says on the syllabus. All right. Whatever it says on the syllabus, which is probably Wednesday. But, but yeah, double check. I'm pretty sure that column says that assignments are due the Wednesday of that week. So it, it probably says finals week, projects due. So that would, be, that would be Wednesday. But again, double check to make sure that my memory is, is right. That's why I put it there, because otherwise I can't remember anything. All right. We have, I'm going to drop the diagram that I, I draw in most of my classes because understanding it is really important as far as understanding how the, the client, that is a person sitting at their computer or using a mobile device or even a search engine crawling the internet, indexing search terms. All these are examples of clients because they're making requests to a web server. The web server is, again, a computer that's installed with specific software that's enabled to listen for requests and respond to them. So, the diagram looks like this. Client, internet, which is a cloud, server. Remember, the server responds to requests. Clients make requests. All right? You know, you think of it as, you know, a, a client, a customer, and a server in a restaurant. You make requests to the server, and the server responds to them. Now, the response could be, I'm sorry, we're, we're out of chicken today, you know? The, re the, the, the response is not always a successful response. The response can be there's been a problem, there's been an error, you've requested a page that doesn't exist, any number of different things. Remember with server-side scripting, and we talked about forms a little bit ago, uh, a few classes back, the server doesn't necessarily have completed HTML pages out there. It can have scripts. And another way to think of a script is sort of a recipe, a program to create a web page. And if you think about it, it sort of makes sense because if you think about Google and you can search on anything that you can think of on Google, it would be absurd to think that there was a completed HTML page for every possible item that you could possibly think of to search for. All right. So instead what you have is you have a list of scripts and these can be written in PHP or ASP.NET or any number of different languages. And the server interacts with a database. So if I request, if I do a search for HTML5, for example, that request, including the search term, my input parameters, <coughs> makes it through the internet hits the appropriate server, the server uses, the, the script uses the search term to look in the database, find the pages related to that, and returns to me a web page. A web page consisting of HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. 
The server does the heavy lifting, the heavy processing. All right, interacting with databases, that's, that's heavy processing compared to the stuff that the client does. And we'll talk about some of the stuff the client does in a second. Now normally, all right, if we're talking about changing the page, normally that consists of, or in many cases, it consists of interacting with the server again. So for example, if I didn't want to search for HTML5, but I wanted to search for CSS3, that would involve going back to the server, having the server re-look up in the database um, CSS3, and then creating a new web page. So normally that's how the client and server interact. Every request to the page is a request through the internet to the server and the server responds to it. It'd be like every anytime you wanted something else, you interacted with your server in the restaurant. You know, can I get uh, a second order of fries? Can I get dessert? Can I get another cup of coffee? In all those cases, you are interacting with the server. Every time you want something new, you ask the server and the server brings it to you. And that's good for what, you know, what I've described as the heavy lifting, when there's database interactivity involved, when the server in the restaurant has to go back in the kitchen and ask the chef for more fries. You wouldn't want every client running back there and grabbing fries out of the deep fryer on their own. That wouldn't be a good idea. All right. However, if you think about it, in a restaurant, they do give the client the ability to customize or to change up their meal a little bit. How do they do that? Well, they have salt and pepper and ketchup and mustard, and depending on the restaurant, hot sauce, sugar and cream for the coffee, and so on. So in other words, if I want to change up my meal a little bit, if the fries are delicious but they could use just a touch more salt, I don't have to bother the server and flag the server down and say, hey, can you get me some salt? have the server sprinkle some salt on, me taste it, say, no, I need a little bit more, flag them down again. That would be a pain for everyone, right? You know, the server's out there trying to serve other customers and bringing them their, de uh, the, their meals, and you're flagging them down to sprinkle a little more salt. So they give you the capability to make some small changes. They're not giving you access to a deep fryer, you know, sort of the heavy lifting of the restaurant trade, they're giving you access to these little things that you can use to customize your page a little bit. Customize your page. You can see where this is leading. Customize your dinner a little bit. And client-side JavaScript is the same idea. All right? The server, when it delivers a page to you, it gives you JavaScript. And this JavaScript allows you to make some small changes to your page that don't require a lot of resources. In other words, they don't require you having to know how to work a deep fryer or anything like that. And these tools allow you to change or customize your page without having to go back to the server. And it's a win-win situation, right? It's a win for the client because they get an instantaneous result or virtually instantaneous. In other words, if I'm sitting here eating my fries and I think, gee, I want some ketchup on it, Boom, I grab the ketchup, squirt it on it, and there it is, right? If I had to flag down the waiter to get ketchup for my fries, to squirt the ketchup on my fries, I'd have to, waiter, waiter, you know, raise my hand, wave my hand. The waiter's off serving other tables, back in the kitchen, doing all kinds of stuff. And eventually, the waiter might come over and squirt the ketchup on it. By then, maybe my fries are cold or whatever all right so it's a win for me because i have control i can go and i can boom i can get instant results without having to wait for the server to be ready to process me all right it's a win for the server too believe me the server would not get a lot of joy out of being called over every time someone wants to squirt a little bit more ketchup or sprinkle a little bit more salt on their fries the server is off doing the things that only servers 
can really do, right? Going back into the kitchen and talking to the chef and getting the food and bringing it back up and taking orders and, and taking checks up with the credit cards or whatever. That's stuff that the server has to do. You're not going to trust clients to do that stuff, right? But you can trust a client to squirt ketchup or salt on their fries, all right? So it's a win-win situation. The client gets an immediate response. The server isn't bothered with these little piddly sort of requests that, and therefore can focus on the things that are important. Same thing with web pages, all right? The time it takes for a client to make a request through the internet, have it routed all the way around the internet, make it to the server, server process it, and send a response back is ages compared to the amount of time it takes for a few lines of JavaScript code that has been delivered to the client to execute and to do its job. All right? And therefore, the client gets a virtually instantaneous response, just like squirting ketchup on their fries. The server, then, is not bothered with that request, so the server can devote its time to doing the stuff that servers have to do, interacting with scripts in a database. All right, enough sort of abstract thought. Let's see uh, a specific example. And... Let me go to, let me find a page that will work here. Here we go. All right. Here we are on ESPN.com. As I go, and notice that there's some menu selections here. As I put my mouse over different selections, my page gets customized a little bit. In other words, here my mouse is over NFL, and it shows me a list of the top stories that relate to the NFL. Major League Baseball shows me a list of stories. NBA and so on down the line. Now notice how quickly that happens. That happens instantaneously. There's no real delay there. And in fact, even if we were on a slow internet connection, there would not be any delay. Why? Because it's not going back to the server every time I'm asking to display a new menu. There's code that exists on the client that can show and hide the different menus. Okay? So in other words, when I request this page, I get more than meets the eye. Not only do I get the HTML to display this, I also get stuff that I don't see, all those menus that are hidden. I get the HTML code for that. I also get JavaScript to allow for some interactivity. That is, when I put my mouse over one of those links, a different menu selection appears. So as I go across, and again, notice that happens in an instant. In fact, you can, you can sort of tell it's done client-side by if you put your mouse over it, you don't see any little messages on the status bar saying that it's going to the server. The change happens immediately. There's no little waiting down there in the status bar that says waiting for this server and that server. So, 
Why do they do this? Well, it, it makes sense, right? By doing these sort of drop-down menus like this, or pull-down menus, however you want to put it, this saves a lot of space on this. Imagine if you had all these menus visible all the time. The page would be gigantic, all right? So this is a clever way to save a little bit of space on the home page. It's also clever because it doesn't require going back to the server. All this code executes on the client. So, let's consider this from the perspective of the three client-side languages. HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Now this could be done several different ways. I don't know exactly what code they used. I didn't reverse engineer this or whatever, but we can kind of talk about how this is working and, and come to some probably pretty reasonable conclusions. What is contained in HTML? Well, there's probably HTML code for each of the, of the submenus. So in other words, when I request this page from ESPN, as I said before, I get more than meets the eye. Not only do I get the web page itself that's visible, I get HTML code for all of these submenus, all right, that aren't visible at first. That's the content of a web page. Remember, HTML is responsible for the content of the web page. So the content of those menus is in some HTML. CSS. CSS is controlling the visibility of those elements. All right? Remember, CSS deals with appearance, and layout. Well, one aspect of the appearance of something is whether it's visible or not. So, through CSS, we can make those submenus invisible at first. So, when we initially load the page, we don't see those submenus. All right. The HTML content is there, but it's been made invisible, where we do not see it. Yeah, at that point it probably goes to the server because it's requesting a brand new web page. It really depends on the specifics of the situation, but I would guess in this case, like if I go to NBA and click on I can't, I can't, my heart doesn't bear clicking on that one, so we'll go and click on this one. See, we went to another page. All right. But the menu itself is simply accomplished via JavaScript on the main page. All right. Last but not least, we have JavaScript, which provides the interactivity. Now, you can use JavaScript several different ways, but we're going to talk about a very common usage of it for interactivity. And what I mean by interactivity is the user does something. That action is detected. In other words, the web page knows that the user has done something. JavaScript then will change part of the page by accessing and manipulating CSS and HTML. 
Now that sounds like a mouthful. Let's break it down. It's really sort of straightforward. Looking at this example again. User does something. What does the user do? The user puts their mouse over a link. All right? That's the user action that sort of gets the ball rolling. All right? Second thing here that's key is that the page notices that. All right? The page realizes, hey, the user put their mouse over such and such link. That's a signal for JavaScript to kick in and do its thing. Lastly, JavaScript is going to then go and change either the HTML or CSS to change the way the page looks. And we'll go over examples where we're changing the CSS. We'll go over examples where we change the HTML. In this case, it probably changes just the CSS to make that menu visible. Menu started off being invisible via CSS. We can set and make that menu visible by JavaScript. We can change that property of CSS. We set it originally to invisible. We're going to make it visible now. All right. So that's sort of an overview of how these things work together. We have a chunk of HTML code. We use CSS to hide it. We have JavaScript then that changes something about the page. In this case, probably the CSS. Now let's look a little closer at the recipe for JavaScript. First of all, there's going to be a user action, or sometimes called an event, that we have to notice happens. All right. Secondly, we need JavaScript to point to the thing in the page that we want to change. In other words, we want to change that Major League Baseball menu from invisible to visible. So we need, we need a way to point to that HTML code and say, this is the one that we want to change. And then finally, we need the JavaScript language to change attributes. All right? Number one, user events is pretty simple. We'll go over a few examples of those. And after a few minutes of those, you'll probably you'll be pretty much an expert on those. All right. The other two is where the difficulty comes in. Because you have to learn the JavaScript language, which is a different language, different than HTML and CSS, more like a regular programming language, like C Sharp or Java or or other programming languages. You also have to learn something called the DOM. The DOM stands for Document Object Model. There's DOMs for all kinds of different documents on the web, but there's a specific DOM for HTML that JavaScript uses. That DOM is a mechanism by which we can A, point to the thing on the page that we want to change, and B, actually change the attributes. All right. All of this is sort of the preparatory material, and we'll come back to this. Without seeing examples, this might be a little hard to digest completely. So we'll see some examples, and then we'll come back to that. What I'd like to do is I'd like to make a page that contains a little bit of JavaScript in it. Let's make a movie page for The Wizard of Oz. 
I sure hope everyone's seen The Wizard of Oz and this doesn't end up being a spoiler or something for it. But we'll pretend that maybe there's some people that, that haven't seen it. So I'm going to go make an HTML page. So let's say that I had this in the Wizard of Oz, a tornado comes and takes Dorothy to Oz. Then I have a second paragraph that says, in the end, we find out she was just dreaming. Now I look at this and say, ooh, that second paragraph, that's a spoiler, right? Maybe I don't want to say that. Everyone knows, even, you know, even if you've never seen the movie, you probably have an idea that Dorothy's going to end up in Oz, right? Because it's called the Wizard of Oz and not the Wizard of someplace other than Oz, right? But the second part, if you've never seen it before, ooh, you spoiled the ending. So, yes? Are you not worried about the body tags? I am worried about the body tags. I just forgot to put them in. Thank you. So let's look at how we can fix this. If we view the page, right now, because I haven't done anything CSS-wise with it, we're of course going to see both paragraphs. All right. Now, how can we write CSS to hide that second paragraph? One thing you can do is you can make the background and the text the same color. That's one way that you could do it. All right. In fact, I've seen that done a lot of times on websites and, and in that way um, and in that way, um, you know, it's there, but you can't see it. So that's one way to do it. Another way we can do is we can actually make it invisible, all right, via CSS. Now, I'm going to put the style right in the HTML code just for convenience. Again, you should put the style in its own file. Now, if I did this, this is one way to do it. I can say the visibility is hidden. The other way I could do it is I could say display none. What's the difference between the two? With visibility hidden, it's invisible, but it still takes up the space. With display none, it's invisible, and it doesn't take up the space that it, it, it would otherwise. Now if I do this, what's going to be wrong with this picture? Nothing's going to show up, right? So I can't say every paragraph I want to make invisible. So how can I make just this paragraph invisible? Well, I can't call it P2 because there's no such thing as a P2 tag. I can give it an ID. I could either give it an ID or I could give it a class. Alright? So, 
In this case, I'm going to give it an ID. Thanks. ID equals spoiler1. And then I can say, pound sign spoiler1, visibility hidden. All right? So remember with the pound sign in front of it, that means the thing that has this ID. Remember an ID is to be unique on the page. All right? An ID is to be unique on the page. So I should not have anything else on the page that has an ID of spoiler one. So if I do this again, there should be an ID of spoiler two or whatever. I could give things a class of spoiler, for example. Depending on how much time we have, we, we might play around doing that. But again, I could give it a class and, and then I could give it a class, actually a class and an ID, and we could, we could take care of it that way. So now if I look at it, I save it, I view it in the browser, and I see this. And the Wizard of Oz, a tornado comes and takes Dorothy to Oz. And I don't see that other paragraph. And it's not like it's there and, you know, I can't select it, I can't see it at all. All right? So, yes? Uh-huh. It, it, that's a good question. If I give something a if I give something a class and an ID, what star rules does it take? In a general in general terms, the more specific to an element the style rule is, that gives it precedence. So, for example, a class points to many, can point to many things. An ID points to just one. So the ID is more specific to a class, so I believe the ID would take precedence. That's, that's just like if I were to take, if I were to have a rule for paragraphs and a rule for ID. All right, same idea, right? Well, which one takes precedence? Well, a paragraph is true for all paragraphs. An ID is true just for that one, so it's more specific, so that one would take precedence. Great, excellent question. Now, if I define different style rules, for example, if I made a paragraph have a background of green and I didn't say that, and if I didn't change that in the ID, it would still get that background of green, but it would get the new attributes from the ID. All right? So, again, our three languages that we're using here. Our content is in HTML. Right, the actual text that of this paragraph is in HTML. The appearance of it, or in this case, the invisibility of it, is set via CSS. Now, the last thing we need is we need JavaScript to go and change that. All right. So I'm going to put a button here. Now, this will not be a submit button. This will be a plain old button. Remember back when we talked about form controls, I said there was something that I was just going to call a button button. All right? It's not a submit button. This will not send a request to the server. It simply is a way for me to invoke a piece of JavaScript. All right? So a submit button has a certain default behavior. Submit button says, hey, I'm ready to make a request to the server. Send all this data to the server. A button doesn't do anything until you write some code, and that code is going to be in JavaScript. All right. Getting back to our little formula here. Oh, here is the HTML code. I think I was not showing it in Ridgeville. Sorry, I set uh, two paragraphs. One, I gave an ID of spoiler. Spoiler, I made the visibility hidden. 
And so if you look at that, you see the one paragraph and not the second one. Now, though, I want to put some JavaScript in to change that. So I'm going to use a button. I have to write something for the browser to detect the user event. These user events all start with the word on, O-N. For a button, the user event is on click, right? What do you do with a button? Typically, you click a button. We can go and do a quick Google, and there's, a, there's a several different methods, several different events that we can write JavaScript for. Mouse events, on click, on double click, on drag, on mouse over, on mouse up. on key down, on key press, on key up. All these relate to the ways that the user can interact with the page. Any of you use Twitter? Do you know what Twitter is at least? All right. With Twitter you could enter in a 140 character message and publish it for the world to see. So you can let people know exactly what kind of sandwich you're having as long as you can summarize it in 140 characters or less. As you're typing in there, it counts down how many characters you have left. All right? So every time you press a key, it deducts one. So you start out with 140. If I typed an A, I'd be down to 139. That is, there's JavaScript in there to look at the key press event. So when the user presses a key, a little snippet of JavaScript runs and says, hey, I want to deduct one more character from the list of characters they have left. So just a little routine. With buttons, normally what you do is you click a button. All right? So I'm going to say on click equals, and this will be the code that fires off when the user clicks the button. So on click is, is a common event with a button, right? That, that's what you do to a button, is you click it. We'll see more examples of this. On, the typical ones that you use are on click, on mouse over, on mouse out, on key press, all those sorts of things. So, on click, I can put a JavaScript statement. And I can put that JavaScript statement between the quotes. All right? Now, let's describe in words what I want to do. Go ahead. Right. I want to make this specific paragraph visible. All right? Keep in mind, I could have a dozen spoilers on this page. This button is going to show this spoiler. All right. In fact, I'll give it a value of show as spoiler 1. So when I click on this button, I want to show this specific paragraph. All right. I might have other spoilers, and I don't want to show those. I want to show just that one specific paragraph. So the first thing I have to do is I have to point to that paragraph. I need JavaScript to point to that paragraph and then change the attributes. How do I do that? I use what is called the DOM, or Document Object Model. Now, there's an instruction in the Document Object Model that's sort of a workhorse in JavaScript. And, pardon me? And that is document dot get element 
by ID and then enclosed in parentheses, enclosed in quotes, is going to be the ID that we want. In this case, we want spoiler 1. Let's look at this and break it down. And this is our first example of looking at a DOM expression. Document means it's somewhere on the web page. Now that may seem odd. Where else would it be if not on the web page? Well, it could be somewhere else. All right. We're not going to get into that now, but document means I want to change, I want to look at, I want to change something on this web page. Get element by ID. All right. That says find a thing on the page that has this ID because I want to do something to it. All right. Find the thing on the page that has this ID. So what that expression would do, document get element by ID, would be to point to this paragraph. All right. Now that I've pointed to that paragraph, guess what I can do? I can use the JavaScript language to change the attributes. In other words, I can make it appear. So let me finish the instruction here, and then we'll review it again. On click, document, get element, by ID, Let me make it maybe a little smaller. That style, that visibility equals visible. All right, that's a mouthful. On click equals document get element by ID spoiler one dot style dot visibility set to visible. So what am I doing? I'm finding the thing on the page that has an ID of spoiler one. That's this guy. I'm changing something about its style. So I say dot style. What am I changing about the style? I'm changing the visibility of it. What am I setting it to? I'm setting it to visible. So this is another way of simply changing what I set up here. All right? I'm just changing attributes of the style. Now notice a couple things I want you to notice about this. First of all, this is case sensitive. In other words, notice that I put document with a lowercase d. You have to do that. It will not recognize document if you have an uppercase D. JavaScript is case sensitive and the DOM is case sensitive. Get element by ID is capitalized in this, I've heard it called camel notation, where the first letter of the first word is lowercase. Each subsequent word, the first letter is uppercase. So get element by ID. G is lowercase because it's the first word. The E in element, the B in by, and the I in ID are all uppercase because they're the first letter of the subsequent word. Spoiler is the name of my ID. Notice that spoiler is in single quotes. Why is it in single quotes? It's in single quotes because I'm using double quotes to indicate the beginning and end of my JavaScript statement. If I were to put double quotes here, the browser would get confused and think that this from here to here was the entire JavaScript statement. And it wouldn't understand what to do with it and it would blow up. So I use single quotes wherever I need quotes within the double quotes. The things that are in quotes are like values that I supply. All right. 
and not variable names. Literals are called in many programming languages. Now, everything about this except the ID was something that someone else defined. In other words, document get element by ID, that's a JavaScript function. Someone else came up with the name of that. And I have to use that exact name syntax for this to work. To change the style, you have to say dot style dot visibility if you want to change the visibility of the style. Finally, visible is, again, something that's part of the language. I didn't make up that visible. The only thing uh, part of this that I made up is the ID that I wanted to change, and that was spoiler one to point to this guy. So now, when we look at this, it comes up. Oops, my button. Ah. Should say value equals show as spoiler support one. There we go. Because I'm running this in Internet Explorer, it wonders why there is JavaScript on this page. So I have to click on this and say allow block content. Depending on the security settings of your machine or what browser you use, you may or may not have to do something similar to that. So now I go and click on show uh, spoiler one, and boom, there it is. What do you suppose is going to happen if I click on it again? Nothing. It's going to change it to visible while it's already visible. So it's going to be no effect. All right, this is a real simple example, but what I want you to get from this example is the three parts of sort of that JavaScript interaction. First of all, each language is doing its own job and only its own job. That is, the HTML contains all the content whether we see it or not. CSS we use to show and hide the stuff that we don't want to see. So we don't want to see that spoiler one. So we make it invisible. The JavaScript then gives the interactivity. And what do I mean by interactivity? I mean the user does something, the browser notices, then it uses the DOM to find the thing on the page it wants to change and make the change to it. So in this case, on click, that's the user event. The user clicks on the button. I want to notice that, and I want to do something. What do I want to do? I want to find on the web page the thing that has an ID of spoiler one. I want to change its style. I want to set its visibility to visible. And that's how that works. Now, become incredibly more complex than this. But the three basic parts of it are going to stay the same. There's going to be some user action that gets the ball rolling. In most cases, that, that is. There's going to be some user action that gets the ball rolling. We're going to point to different things on the page and change something to it. And then finally, we're going to change some aspect of it. Getting back to the ESPN example, The user action is not to click on something, but simply put your mouse over it. So instead of on click, the event's going to be on mouse over. Now the code that actually does this could be much more complex than ours, but in essence, it's going to do the same thing. It's going to find the things on the page that it wants to show, and it's going to show them. All right? So it's going to find the submenu for the NBA or the NHL or NCAA, and it's going to point at it, and it's going to make it visible. All right? Now, I might do a lot more stuff because it's a much bigger and more complicated example. But in a nutshell, they're doing the same thing here that we're doing in ours. It's just that ours is a very streamlined and, and, and you know, a simplified example of it. Yes? 
They got that code for each thing. That's right. To point at, to point at the different submenus and make it visible. So each of those links has an on mouse over and when you put your mouse over it, each of those links is geared towards making a certain submenu appear. Yep. Yes. Probably, yeah. In other words, um, like, and there's other other sites that do it too, but uh, the Perkins School of the Blind, I think we showed. Here you can go and you can set the size of certain text. You can set the color. In a nutshell, that's what they're doing. They're going in and they're simply changing um, CSS attributes on different elements on the page. Now all this starts from the perspective of you have a clean division between the HTML and CSS, right? If you're using font tags to do this, for example, which you should never use, this would be a pain to do. But if you're using CSS, then it's going to be much more straightforward to do. Other questions? All right, we'll continue on Wednesday with more examples of this.